Yes. No, we all know. Thank you. Okay. So, well, let me start again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Lawrence, for the lovely introduction. Thanks, Demetrius, Kirk, uh, Dionysius, and, and Lawrence for organizing the conference, right? Lawrence is both my introducer and a co-chair with Kirk. Demetrius and Dionysius for the uh, uh, program. Uh, Kirk has uh, done a little bit more than me, but that's okay. <laughs> I, I, I can suspect. Not <laughs> Thanks to Demetrius and Dionysius. And, and I was very interested to hear no, Demetrius' introduction about the selection process, which certainly is something that I'll, I'll take to heart next, next conference I do. Um, and I think this was a fantastic uh, way you did it, uh, Demetrius. Congratulations. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, the, the rise of matrix processing. And like I said, it's in the context of Power 10, which is something that I uh, worked for five years. And I want to acknowledge all the people that I work with to make this a reality, right? It took about a thousand people, if you know everybody that worked hardware, software, um, you know, during the project and a total of about five years to, to bring Power 10 from concept to reality, right? And I list some of my collaborators, some of the people that were incredibly important for me to accomplish this work on matrix units that I, that, that I did. And some people that actually made all these things that you're going to see here work. No, I think I you know I, I had kind of a, a vague idea of what a matrix unit should be, and the people here are the ones that made it a reality. Uh, Brian Tompton was the core architect, Bill Starkey, the chip architect, and Hung Lee was kind of a mentor. He he's retired now. He's an IBM no, retired fellow, but uh, he he was he was really a mentor that kind of pushed me into into doing this matrix unit work for Power 10. But again, I, I want to talk about matrix units in general and matrix processing. And uh, no, it, I, I, I say the following, not just because it's recommended, but because no, I, I want, no, these are my opinions, right? And they may be wrong. Um, uh, they may help you have some questions, but I'll, I'll give you my perspective of things. And they're my perspective. Nobody else has to agree with those. And certainly nobody else, IBM or inside has to agree with those. So beginning with some obvious preliminaries, I think everybody has an idea of what the scalar computing is. The scalar computing is the computing that we have been doing since uh, uh, ENIAC. Um, uh, you, you produce essentially for each operation, um, um, you, you, pro you produce one element of result and um, you, you typically you fetch two, two pieces of data, an X and a Y. You can fetch a third piece of data, you combine these things and you produce a new piece of data. In this particular case, I'm showing as a, as a multiply add operation. So you multiply X and Y, uh, add to A and store A back. So you have to fetch three elements from the register file and store uh, the result element. And for the past 50 years, no, it's no, pretty, pretty accurate 50 years, um, the go-to approach to get more performance out of computers, or at least more raw performance, no, whether it works for your computation or not, it depends. But the way to get more raw computation has been vector computing, where you fetch not one element, but a vector of n elements, um, x, vector x, vector y, and you do, let's say, a multiply element by element, and you add element and elements to a, to, a, to a previous value a, and you store back the a. So a multiply add of a vector of n elements, you do n operations, so you, you, you increase the number of operations that you do at the same time, um, but you do n operations on n elements, so you didn't really change the fundamental ratio of operations per elements. So um, from an engineering perspective, it's very efficient, right? Uh, doing a vector of n elements is more efficient than doing n scalars of one element. But from a conceptual view or from a, even from a limit view, nothing changed. You, you did one operation for one element, now you do n operations for n elements. Now, um, in matrix computing is fundamentally different. And matrix computing can you know, take different forms, but the, the, the essential form that you know, is done today, and it's the, it's the form that is you know, mathematically sound, you, you have this operation called an outer product. It has, you no, know, we actually, I'll mention a different name in a moment, but it's, it's an outer product. You fetch two vectors of n elements each, a vector x and a vector y. Each one has n elements, but now you do 
The outer product, me meaning for each element of X, you combine with all the element, each and every element of Y. So you take X0 and you combine with Y0, Y1, Y2, Y3. You take X1 and you combine with I, Y1, Y0, Y1, Y2, Y3, and so on. So you build a, you actually do N square operations. If you don't, you only fetch N elements or, or 2N, I mean, let's know what, what is a factor of two among friends, right? But you fetched N elements and you created N square or you produced N square results and you performed N square operations. So this is a fundamental change because now I can do much more operations per element. Now you may ask, well, but you, you didn't, you still have all these elements in the middle here that say the elements that are being computed are and updated. And the point of the, and this is kind of an engineering decision, but it's an important engineering decision. These elements that are being updated, you know, the, you, you, you multiply X and Y and you update an A, the elements that are being updated can be resident in the matrix unit where the operations are being performed. So all these green elements are there already in the unit that is going to do the work with the blue elements and the red elements. So the data that is moving are the X and the Ys and the, 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 no, the blues and the reds and the green is not moving. And that's very important from an implementation perspective an efficiency perspective. And I'll, 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 I'll show some you know, actual data on that. Um, the, um, this operation, this outer product is generalized into a blast two operation called the rank one update, it's the GER. You know, some people wrote, know about the GEM or the GMV, but the, the GER is also a BLAS operation. And when you look at the, the instructions that we named in Power 10, we actually named them GERs. They are GER instructions. And people talk about GER instructions and this, at least in our, you know, in our inner, you know, inside IBM. Um, uh, so it's, 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 it may be an unusual name, but it came from the BLAST2 operation, which is, it's an outer product of two vectors, X and Y, and you add to a matrix A. So the one dimensional input vectors, I said, they come from the main register file. So they have need to be transported from register file to the functional unit. The two dimensional accumulator, which is this green elements, which are these green elements, they reside local to the unit that is doing the computation. So like I said, very efficient. And you now the, 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 the drawing that I showed here is explicit for a vector of 128 bits and elements of 32 bits. So four element vectors of 128 bits. What if your elements are smaller, like 16 bits, for example? So we treat a vector of 128 bits as having two columns of x's and two rows of y's. And then you do multiple rank one updates. We do first, first column, first row, second column, second row. Um, and this rank k update can be exploited, which is the native operation the heart can, can do, can be exploited by a variety of computational kernels. Plus three and plus two, kind of obvious that we can do, but we can also use them for sparse matrix operations. We can do direct convolution, meaning convolution that you don't first transform the convolution the matrix multiply, which you can always do that, but no, doing the convolution directly, we can use for discrete Fourier transform and for stencil computations and, 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 and other things. But no, these are just no, some, some of the things that we can do with a rank K up or a rank one update or no, a rank K update is just K rank one update. Um, matrix multiply, if, you, if you're not familiar, you may be, you may be familiar, but it's, um, no, it's, it's, it's very easy to do matrix multiply with rank one updates. You, if you have an M by N matrix, which is the product of an M by K by a K by N matrix, you take the rows, the, sorry, the columns of the first matrix, in this case, matrix X, and the rows of the matrix Y. So first column, first row, do an outer product, update A. Second column, second row, do an outer product and update A. And by doing a sequence of K outer products, you, um, you have computed the matrix multiply. And the key is to do this on a panel of A that is small enough to fit inside your processor. And in fact, we're gonna do inside the matrix unit. So you don't have to move this. You just stream X, stream Y, and you update a resident in the matrix unit. Convolution, like I said, can also be done. So if you have, let's say, a sequence of filters and a sequence of windows, you can see the window one here is, is the window zero shifted because no, in convolution, you, 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 go through the, you go through the image windows. 
you can actually do the outer product of you you you, you actually assemble these vectors in um, the uh, if if you get the vectors together the columns are the filters and the windows into the image but you do outer product of the rows okay so you you build you build a matrix essentially out of um, uh, the, the the filters and the images, but then you do outer product of the rows, and uh, if you add together all the outer products, you end up with a convolution of different windows and different filters. And this can be a very a very big computation, very important for uh, convolution and neural networks and and, um, and 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 other cases. And then you no, know, the the thing that some people may may be surprised is that you can actually you do use matrix units for doing sparse matrix. Now sparse matrices, well, there are lots of zeros. So how can I find something that can actually be turned into a a a, a, a computation performing a matrix unit? And you can. So there is no shameless plugin. Sharif Yassil, who I think is here on the on the talk, will give a, uh, on, on this talk will be giving his own talk tomorrow on uh, at this conference on Wednesday, and he's going to explain how he takes a sparse matrix, very sparse matrix, no, 99%, 99.9% sparse matrix, and he finds and he partitions that matrix into blocked par blocked parts, which can be computed efficiently on a matrix unit, and then a more conventional CSR part that can be computed on vector units. So Sharif actually uses both the vector unit and the, and the matrix unit to do his sparse matrix computation. So I encourage you to see that talk. Um, other question I get a lot is, well, um, this is a very specialized operation compiler. Will compilers ever be able to generate code for it? Well, it's true that the code we have generated so far, both inside IBM and outside IBM has been hand generated no, by human beings. Um, but there is also work on compilation for matrix units that especially people from University of Alberta and Unicamp that work on the Colonel Ferrer project. They have extended LLVM um, um, to uh, recognize, to do the recognition of, of linear algebra constructs, both GEM and, and SYR2K and other, other BLAS operation. They correctly identify 112 LLVM test cases, and they once they identify what that uh, intermediate representation is, it can replace with code that then generate code to use the matrix unit. And they have been very successful. They have, uh, for example, uh, I show here in the bottom um, uh, results of code generated by their compiler from source code, from, from C++ source code, which they recognize the patterns and then uh, and identify that it's a matrix multiply and, and replace with, with code that they generate using the matrix unit. And you can see that uh, for some small matrices, they, they get actually better performance using their uh, kernel fairer compiler. That's the light blue column here. Then the, um, uh, our own optimized BLAST, the BLAST that IBM optimized for using the matrix unit. So if, if, if the matrix unit BLAST is one, their code generated gets you know, maybe 10% better in some cases and within 10% on some other cases, which is a few percent here. So very competitive code generated by a compiler to the best library that we could produce by hand. So yes, compilers can produce uh, code for matrix units. So before, well, let me do one more slide and I'll, I'll pause to see people have questions. Um, so you have a matrix unit which can do these, outer, do these outer product operations and produce matrices as results. And I think, no, there are at least four ways that you can organize your matrix unit in your you know, bigger system. And um, uh, the one that um, uh, we chose in Power 10 was to make it integral to the core. So just like a core running user threads has a load store unit, has a vector store, a vector scalar unit, it now has a matrix unit. And it, it feeds from the same register file, except for the, accumu the accumulators are inside the matrix unit, but the inputs feed from the register file. That is the same one used by all the other units. Um, you can do an attached functional unit, which is, no, it's still the, it's still the same user thread, um, invoking instructions that are either vector instructions, load store instructions, or matrix instructions. But the matrix unit has its own register file, even for the input. So everything comes out of a dedicated matrix register file. And um, also, you don't necessarily have to go to the same L1 cache. You probably shouldn't because matrices consume a lot of cache. So you might as well feed directly from the L2, L3, or, or the memory if you can. Um, but it's the same user code 
issuing instructions either for the register unit or the matrix unit. There's a more you know, coprocessor approach where you have your core, which does your instructions, and then you have an accelerator, which you know, may not run user program, but it runs some kind of control to do complicated operations. And the core just says, please take these two matrices and multiply for me. And the accelerator will feed the matrices from the memory and have its own cache and memory hierarchy and do the operation and put the result back into memory. So it's it's it kind of can be asynchronous as well. So the process can be, the, the user process can be doing some computation while the accelerator is doing the matrix multiply. And really you know the most modern uh, approach today is to have something external. So you have a CPU, which does not have a matrix unit. Most CPUs today don't have matrix units, but you have something outside, either a GPU or a TPU, who essentially either is a matrix unit or has a lot of matrix units. No, GPUs have a lot of matrix units. So they can do the work for you, but they have their own memory. They can be in the same address space. May not be, well, no, the, the, the CXL is just one way to connect. There are many other ways to connect. But it's it's almost independent. I mean, this is one, one computer. This is a different computer. They are doing you no know, different. They're they are they are doing their own work on their own space. And uh, you no, know, this computer, this GPU TPU, is very specialized with lots of matrix units. Okay. So before I go to the next part of the talk, where I will talk more about Power Ten specifically, let's see if there are any questions about this first you no know, kind of general introduction. And feel free to ask because if you ask me something that is too long, I will I will pause and tell you, you no. Know, well, let's let's resume later. Hey, Jose, I have a question. Yes. So the, the four types of metrics units, I guess the granularity of the metrics operation, you know, kind of dictates, you know, what kind what organization is the best. Am I right about that? So so yeah, that's a that's a that's an interesting way to say. I usually think the opposite, like is the the, the organization yeah. you chose dictates yeah. the matrices that I can do. But yeah. yes, absolutely. I guess, yes. I guess the real question is what are the common what's the common granularity of these operations? Yeah. So uh, let me I'll, I'll I'll talk a little bit about that, Dimitri. So if at the end you're not you're not happy with with what you see, we 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 can talk. But um I, I think it's important to be able to support as small as possible. Okay. Because for sparse, obviously, the bigger you make, the more difficult it is to find the blocks, right? So um, uh, as you will see in Sharif's work, no, he did a very good job when working with matrix units of size four by four. He found a lot of good stuff to do in the matrix units. If they were a little bit larger, eight by eight, you know, it wouldn't be as easy to find the good stuff that can go there. So it's an interesting, but of course, you no, know, it's N square. So the bigger the N, the better. Right, but it's less applicable. It's that trade-off between you no, know, oh, I can do more, but well, if you can find more, yes, you can do before, but we're not be able to find more. So I, I, I like to keep it relatively small, um, but no, there are cases where you can do big ones. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Just, just yes. if you have a big one, can't you use so it's multiple granularity? If you have a by eight, you can do four, four by four. Well, uh, um, um, maybe, but you you have to. So um, depends because it doesn't it doesn't necessarily scale on all the axes, right? You you uh, uh, four four by fours. So eight eight by eight is not really um, uh, four four by fours. It's eight four by fours, right? Yeah, because perfect. you also escape, You have to scale the uh, the the k axis too. So. Um, and 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 do you really have you no know, the um, uh, can you really find the blocks that fit right? Because now you have to 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 format your data so that it fits in an eight by eight, right? So it is possible, and and many of the larger units which I'll refer to. So the the unit coming up on Sapphire Rapids is larger than one on the Power Ten. There's no I don't need to make a secret because you can read about it. So, um, but. And they have a way to configure so you can do smaller things. So it's important. Like if you have a big unit, you need to be able to configure so it can do a smaller work, as opposed to just oh, let's cast the problem into the bigger problem. That that is that is not very efficient. Casting a small problem into a bigger problem is not very good. Being able to configure a big unit into operating a smaller one that's that's a better solution. Um, mm -hmm. You're definitely correct. I didn't think about these like, nesting inside that little four by four actually requires separate inputs. And the, but there, I think the, uh, because the inputs is linear, the computation square is probably still worthwhile if you have 
the parallelism to use the uh, them simultaneously, meaning to provide more inputs. Yeah, if you, if, like I said, if you can, if you can control, if you, if you can avoid the uh, the pitfall of the third axis, yes. Let's. I, I suggest that we keep some okay. of these companies also. Uh, question, sorry, for uh, the end of the talk. So let me Let's, um, let, let, let Jose continue. So let me let me continue, and uh, no time goes. It's amazing how fast time goes. <laughs> I'm already halfway through what I should. Okay. Um, anyway, I um, let me uh, uh, let me say a little bit about Power Ten. So Power Ten is 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 the current IBM Power Processor for enterprise computing. So it's a it's a processor that um, was designed to run you know, commercial workloads and the traditional uh, databases and application servers. But you no, know, from a um, uh, looking forward perspective, it was very important for Power 10 to be a strong engine for what we call business analytics, which is you know, essentially analysis of data uh, in large quantities using either graph algorithms, classical machine learning, deep learning, the computational financing algorithms. And um, that data is data that is typically already in the machine because the machine is doing the transactions, for example, for the computational finance, but now we need to analyze the data. So we need to make a machine that could do business analytics very well, and we needed more compute power. And we accomplished that compute power by both um, enhancing the vector units themselves. Now, Power 10 has twice the vector units of Power 9. But we introduced this matrix unit, which is yet another doubling of performance because we wanted even more. We wanted to be able to do um, 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 all this business analytics. So the matrix unit in Power 10 is not as optimized for deep learning as you see in some cases. It's, it's really for all of these things, the graph algorithms. That's why I focus so much on, on, on getting no good sparse performance, classical machine learning, which uses a combination of sparse and dense linear algebra, deep learning, which uses some or very often reduced precision and computational finance. So how did we do the matrix unit in Power 10, we introduce a new instruction set architecture facility. It's called the uh, matrix, uh, it's MMA. It, it means matrix multiply assist. Um, whether that was the best name or not, I don't know, but that's the name we, we adopted. And it's, 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 the, it's a set of instructions. I'm, I'm gonna talk about the actual hardware uh, uh, later, but it's an instruction set which defines a new, new set of uh, registers called the accumulators. Um, they are uh, each accumulator is a four by four array of 32 bit elements. It can be extended to 64 bit. It becomes a four by two array uh, because it's the same size. It's a 512 bit accumulator. And um, the vector scalar registers are, which already exist in the architecture, are going to be the inputs, right? They are the, the vectors that come in and uh, 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 are operated on the um, uh, to, to do the outer product and update the accumulator. Um, so the operation for for a 32 bit floating point is very simple. Each each input vector is either a, a column or a row, and you do the outer product and you update an accumulator. If you, if the if your input date is 16 bit, so each vector register holds two columns or two rows, and you do you no know, first column first row plus second column second row, and you update the four by four. The accumulator is almost always a 32 bit you no know, four by four of 32 bits except for um, um, uh, double precision where it's four by two. Um, so we, are, we also can handle eight bit data. So each input is a four by four matrix of eight bit, bit elements or four bit elements where each input is a four by eight matrix. So we, we, we really cover a broad spectrum of data types. No, so 32 bit floating point, 16 bit floating point, both B float and IEEE B float 16. 16-bit integer, 8-bit integer, 4-bit integers, and then the 64-bit floating point, in which case the accumulator is no longer a 4 by 2, 4, it's a 4 by 2. Uh, the x vector, which is the column vector, is, is, is a four-element double vector. Now, our vectors in power are relatively short, they're 128 bits. So you, you need a pair to form a four-element vector, and then a third uh, vector provides you the two uh, the two-element row, which will be outer product you know, x and y. Um, and I think, so the, so the instructions actually have this form is an XV, they always begin with XV, extended vector, the type tells you if it's a 32-bit float or 64-bit float, it's a GUR, right, that's from the BLAS, it's a GUR operation, and then the rank, so for 32-bit, for, for it's a rank 1, for 16-bit, it's a rank 2 update, 
For eight bit, it's a rank four. For four bit, it's a rank eight. And uh, no, we were successful in uh, delivering a processor with you no know, performed well, much better than Power Nine, both on vector processing. So the DGEM um, on um, uh, with the vector alone is about twice as fast as Power Nine, which is expected because we have twice as many vector units. Have four vector units instead of two, and the vac and the and the and the DGEM with the matrix unit is is about twice that of the uh, of the vector, which is what we expected because the total throughput of our vector of our matrix unit is twice that of our vector units. And lean pack, we got close to three teraflops. So as far as we know, it's the fastest single chip processor, like one die, um, one die of power ten. It's uh, which I'll show is is it gives about three teraflops. Um, the code itself is just a call to the uh, LA pack uh, triangular factorization triangular solve. Um, no, the, 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 the libraries we have, no, we have updated the no, heavily modified the library so that they can exploit the matrix unit and all the parallelism. Um, so we, we get we get got good performance. Um, we got good performance on ResNet and BERT as well. No, we had expected about uh, no three and a half x improvement over Power Nine and Power Ten with the matrix unit. In some cases, we got a little over four and a little over uh, no three and a half for for ResNet, a little over four for BERT. So the the code does no. We we got the results that we wanted, and these are relative to Power Nine. So the the raw performance is a factor of four. And uh, we got you no know, close to that with the um, um, uh, with the matrix unit. Um, more important, we got that with significant power efficiency, right? Because um, uh, you no, know, even though we get a lot more flops per cycle uh, in power ten, so this 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 first set of bars here is it's flops per cycle. Power nine was one. That's that's the ratio. That's not that it does one flop per cycle, but whatever it does is called one. So power 10 with the vector units only got a 2x improvement, but with the uh, a matrix unit, we got better than a 5x improvement in, in raw performance. And the core power, you can see it's only a little different, the, the power between the power 10 with vector uh, operations and with matrix operations, a little bit less. So very, very big improvement in power efficiency. Actually, power efficiency went up by over 7x. Now, why, why is you no know, matrix processing inherently more power efficient? Well, because essentially you move, you move data less, right? You move less data and you move it lower, dis less distance. So if you take the total power of a, uh, um, of, of, a, of a piece of hardware, you have you no know, static power, which is mostly do, do, done to, through leakage and dynamic power, which is the power actually you know, doing the computation and dynamic power, can be either because of logic transitions, which the matrix computer doesn't change that, right? You still have to do the same operations that you did a vector transition, but you do a lot less data movement, right? So for example, consider the equivalent, and now equivalent matrix unit and vector unit in the following way. I'm gonna have a, a, a matrix unit that can produce 512 bits of result per cycle. And I'm gonna have a vector unit that can also produce 512 bits of results per cycle. So if I were to do that, well, on a vector unit, I have to fetch 512 bits of X. I have to fetch 512 bits of Y. I have to fetch 512 bits of my accumulator and I have to store the accumulator. So I end up moving 2048 bits over a relatively long distance because it has to go from the register file to the functional units and back. With the matrix unit, I move 128 bits from the register file to the matrix unit, 128 bits from the uh, register file to the matrix unit, and the 512 bits of result, which are already there, they don't have to move. They are already in the matrix unit. So you read the accumulator, you update with the outer product, and you store back in the matrix unit. So you avoid moving, you know, so you go from 2048 bits moving over a long distance to 128 plus 128, so 256 bits moving over the same distance, so one eighth of the product, right? Bits times distance. And these 512 bits, essentially you don't move. And, and, and you have to move a little bit, but I'll show you then when I get into the physical details, you'll see that you actually move very little. So that's where the savings come. It's not from the logic transitions. You still have to do the work, right? We are doing the same computation. It's numerically the same result, but no, you move data a lot less and that's where your savings come, okay? 
So again, I'm going to take a pause because this, I think, is one of the biggest, let's say, contributions of the matrix unit. You know, it's, because performance, no, you can get the same performance by having bigger vectors. It's the no, but you have to move more data. It's it's no. And, and, and the matrix unit really is more efficient. You get more computation with less data or, or the same data. Any questions? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about power 10. So the power 10 chip is, is, is big, but it's not gigantic. It's about 600 square millimeters. Now there are chips today with 800 square millimeters. So it's, it's a big chip, but not absolutely gigantic. Um, it has 15 SMT8 cores. These are the uh, uh, SMT8 cores, so eight threads. In fact, they're organized as two half cores of SMT4. So I also, I like to think more of them as, as 30 SMT4 cores or 120 hardware threads. It doesn't know whether it's 15 SMT8 or 30 SMT4, doesn't matter. Uh, we do have modules with two of these. Um, um, the results I showed so uh, were all for the single chip module. Uh, a lot of interconnect bandwidth. Um, and the matrix unit is integral to it to the core. So the matrix unit on every core, you see is this red mark, this red rectangle here, that's the matrix unit. Okay. So if you were to add the matrix unit of all the cores, the matrix units of all the cores, you get about 10 square millimeters of silicon or 1.6% of the chip area. So it's no, it's 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 respectable, right? It's no you no. Um, every square millimeter counts, but um, uh, it's not enormous for the amount of boost in performance we did. Power is more like 10%. So it is, these are, these run hot. They are um, uh, hot units because the whole idea of having a matrix unit is to use it, right? So when, when you use it, you want to use it for, with all you got. So they do get hot. And in fact, you can see here an interesting uh, uh, feature. I don't know if you, if you, if you can tell, I, I didn't mark the, um, but this core and the one on top of it are, are like back to back with the matrix units, right? So this area of the chip has a lot of compute power in one place. It gets hot and no, they, they, they had to cool. It was an engineering uh, issue that had to be resolved, but they had to remove the heat because you're concentrating 10% of the power in 1% of the, or 1.6% of the area, but no for a significant gain in performance when you use it, okay? Um, um, so this is a picture of the core itself. So the core, uh, like I said, this is an SMT8 core. You can think of it as you know, run a line through here and it's uh, you know, an SMT4 core and another SMT4 core and the matrix unit right here. So there's actually, there are two units, one unit for the left core and another unit for the right core. And I will show now uh, kind of a, 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 the organization of one of those two. So a unit that goes with an SMT4 core. So it's interesting because, and this is, uh, uh, this is no really, I think a lot of credit to Andreas, my collaborators, Andreas and, and, and Silvia, they, they came with a physical layout that I don't think anybody could ask more than that, right? The physical layout directly reflects logical layout. So if you think of the accumulators being a four by two, uh, organization of, of, of 64 bit elements. So this is a double precision. It's, it's easier to think in terms of double precision because the floor plan itself is in terms of double precision. So the accumulator is a four by two uh, array of, of 64 bit elements. Of, you can split these into 32 bit elements and becomes four by four if you split this way. So it becomes 32, uh, four by four of 32, but no, it's a four by two of 64 bit elements. The floor plan, of the matrix unit is also a four by two. So each one of these red rectangles is a, a responsible for computing a 64 bit uh, uh, result. Um, there are actually two independent ALUs because we can, we can feed to this unit instructions or operations dispatched from two of our four execution pipes. So pipes two and three they can both uh, dispatch uh, issues or issue operations to the uh, matrix units. So there's a uh, each each of these um, uh, red uh, tiles has a half to handle operations dispatch from pipe two and the other half to dispatch pipe three, the, to, to issue from pipe three. Sorry, I keep saying dispatch, but issue from pipe three, and each half can do a 64-bit result or two 32-bit result. Uh, sorry, one 64-bit multiply add 
two 32 bit multiply adds, four 16 bit multiply adds, four 16 integer bit integer multiply adds, and eight. 8-bit integer multiply ads. I can also do 4-bit. Uh, I think I run out of space here. Um, they have their own register files, which are two read and one write, because this ALU always writes to this. This ALU always writes to this, but they can read from either. So that, you no, know, if one ALU computes an update to accumulator, the next instruction that uses the same accumulator can go to the other ALU. Um, so it's it's fully it's fully you know symmetric in the sense that any ALU can do any any instruction on any accumulator, and you can see the you can see the um, the register files here. So this little sub uh, insert here is the register file. So like I said, there are two per tile, and the rest is computation, right? So most of the um, I think I believe this is a fifteen. 85% breakdown, maybe it's 2080, but that kind, you can see that, you know, the register file occupies a relatively small part um, of, the, um, of the total area. Most of the area is circuit for doing computations. And now you can see why data doesn't travel, right? Worst case, you have data from here going here, right? So this is the extent of the data that has to travel as opposed to vector data, which has, I don't know if you can tell, these are vector uh, register files here. So the vector data has to come all this way, right? While the matrix data, the accumulator is local to the unit and local to the ALU. It's not even local to the unit. It stays within the ALU. And that's why it's, it's, it's more power efficient, okay? Any questions? Okay. Um, if not, I'm, I'm done with power 10. I'll, 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 I'll go over a few uh, other cases of matrix units. Um, no, I, I, I proudly say, and I hope it's right, that power 10 is the first commercial CPU to have a matrix unit, right? Um, but there are things before it that had matrix units. No, GPUs have had matrix units for five years. So it's not the first matrix unit, but it's the first commercial CPU with a matrix unit. But it's not the last. And I want to talk a little bit about others that are coming soon. So any, any questions? Okay. So uh, another case study, um, the IBM Z16, which is, um, uh, has been uh, announced. And actually there was a paper just last week, right? ISCO was last week um, uh, on, on the Z16. We'll have a matrix unit. It's, it's a coprocessor kind of unit, right? So you have the cores in the chip. And you have the matrix unit like on the chip and, and accessible by any core. Um, it, um, uh, the, it's, it's, it's more intended for deep learning than the Power 10. Like I said, Power 10, we did a matrix unit for business analytics in general, supports a variety of standard data types. The, uh, this is for more for deep learning. They support a 16 bit floating point with their own format. It's neither BFLOAT 16, not uh, IEEE. Um, they have their own name. Um, I think the supporting data, I was not involved on, on this work. It's a different approach to matrix unit, but it is a matrix unit and um, it, it has given very good performance for them as well. So any core can share. And uh, the advantage of a coprocessor is that any core can use the full power, right? Um, in, in, in power 10, the, 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 the matrix capability is kind of distributed, right? Each core has its own matrix unit. Um, here is more concentrated in one place, so one thread can use all the all the capability if they want. Um, um, no, and um, and um, no, the other. Oh, and 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 no, the one that no, I can't I cannot speak because, like I said, they were the first, right? So Nvidia Tensor Cores were the first to mainstream matrix process unit. They were not the first matrix unit. There have been matrix units before, but they were the first, like thing that you could buy in quantity and put in multiple machines that had a matrix unit. And they introduced that in the, in the, in the V100, the Volta uh, GPU. And that was five years ago. So they've, and they've gone through multiple generations. They, 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 they say they are, so the Hopper, which is the H100, will be the fourth generation. I, I couldn't figure out which one was the second or third because I know the A100 also has, and I think they call the A100 as the third generation. So there must be something in between the V100 and the A100. But anyway, they, they've been doing this for a while, right? 
And they, um, they are very similar in what they implement uh, in terms of matrix sizes. They, they've been growing their sizes because they want more, more performance. So you know, not a natural way to get more performance of a matrix unit is to grow the size um, of, the, of the matrix that you're computing. But the, if you go to the V100, it was not very different. So the power 10, we take 228 bit vectors. Let's say if, if the if the floating data type is FP16, and I'm using this because it's available on both. Then uh, each input vector, each input vector register holds a four by two matrix of 16 bit uh, 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 floating point numbers. You do first column, first row, second column, second row, and you update a four by four matrix of 32 bit floating point. And uh, that's, the, that's the fundamental operation of the power 10 matrix unit. The fundamental operation of the V100 matrix unit was a, a four by four, so not a big difference. So they did a four by four matrix of FP16 times a four by four matrix of FP16, updates a four by four of FP32. So very much you no know, same approach, kind of you no, know, keep it small. We can use for a lot of things. They actually use for sparse as well. And, um, and they, but they have, they have been growing. And they have been growing uh, with each generation. Um, so in the V in the V100 and the um, uh, uh, was was so when we talk about matrix multiply, you know people like to talk M N and K. M and N are the uh, the dimensions of the uh, the result. So this is M4 N4, and K is the inner dimension which gets reduced. So in power ten, the K is two. In the V100, the K is four, four, four. In the A100, um, from they they, if I understood correctly, they increased this to an eight by four uh, result with an inner dimension of k, and in the age 100 they increased again with an inner dimension of 16. And Chen, this is the point I made about the inner dimension, right? This is the one that is hard to um, if you if you if you don't want. As this grows, this is more difficult to partition. The M and the N are relatively easy to partition. The K is a little bit more difficult to partition, but we can we can talk uh, offline. Um, and um, but they and, and they got fantastic results, right? If you look at the age 100 and the published uh, data, they, which they say can change because I think it's not yet available, at least commercially, but it will be available later. Um, they can get 60 teraflops of FP64 performance all the way up to uh, 1,000 teraflops of FP16 performance, up to 2,000 teraflops uh, of FP8. We, we don't do 8 bit in Power 10. Um, and if, if they have this feature called sparsity, which allows them to skip some computations. And the, they still do, it's the same amount. They do the same amount of work, but, but you can say, well, effectively, if they had done the zeros, it would be this much, this much performance. But no, look, look at this column here as the raw performance and it's significant raw performance. So clear the matrix units is working for them. Um, Intel will be coming up in the Sapphire Rapids with their first implementation of the AMX architecture and the TMO unit. So they, they, they keep it in their documents separate. No, AMX is the architecture, the instructions. T mode is their first implementation, which means clearly they can do. You no, know, they're thinking of doing a different. Maybe they they will do different units in in the future that will still support the same architecture. From what I can tell, and this is me looking at their documents. So if somebody from Intel wants to correct me, I'll be happy to hear. The, the way I'm understanding, it's more of the attached unit because the matrix unit has its own matrix register file. It's a single thread of instructions. Instructions can be either to the left or they go to the left or to the right. So you can interfere freely. Uh, intermix instructions to the vector and scalar units and the matrix units. But if an instruction is to matrix unit, it goes to a different kind of a different entity which has its own register file, its own uh, um, uh, computational units. And I would believe, you know, if it were me, I would feed directly from L2, L3 and memory just because these matrix registers are big. It's one kilobyte per register. They have eight, so it's eight kilobytes of register architected state here. And I think if you were to feed this from L1, you would thrash your L1 pretty quickly. But no, I, I uh, this is this is the organization I'm guessing. No, um, all the errors are mine. Um, you can load uh, tiles directly from into memory, and you can do complete matrix multiplication instructions uh, with those tiles. 
Um, so if I were to uh, do a quick comparison based on data types, you can tell the Sapphire Rapids T-Mole at least was heavily intended for deep learning because they, they focus on int 8 and BF and Bfloat 16, which are the, the, the main um, uh, reduced data types for acceleration. And, and they did a remarkable job on that very fast unit for those. We focused more on everything because we needed something for business analytics. And in fact, most of our customers are still doing the more classical stuff, the FP64 and the FP32 computation, but we want to be ahead of the curve and help them move to the reduced precision. Um, NVIDIA has been doing this game, as I said, for five years. They support FP64. They also support a variety of reduced precision that we don't, including 8-bit floating point and the 32-bit TensorFlow, which is it's not really 32 bits, more like a 19-bit format. Um, they don't support FP32 on their tensor cores. And that I, I couldn't figure out a good a good reason not to have it. Because for us, for us it's very important. We actually know many of our customers do want to do single precision. So we do need the FP32 support. Now, will matrix processing kill vector processing? No, of course not. Vector processing didn't kill scalar processing. And so matrix processors not going to kill vector process. They're all going to coexist. So no, when I was a young man, it would be heresy to ask, but no, there's so many young people now and I'm so old. Do people know who these two things are? These two machines? So I hope you do know the silicon based life form is the Cray-1 supercomputer and the carbon based life form is Seymour Cray is created. And the Cray-1 was the very definition of a supercomputer in 1975. This is, this is the supercomputer. Everything else is no follow on to this, right? And it was no had remarkable capability for its times, 80 megahertz clock speed, 160 megaflops, um, uh, eight megabytes of main memory, had very long vectors, 64 element vectors. And it was the most successful supercomputer of its time by far and not because it was the fastest vector processor, because it wasn't, but because it was the fastest scalar processor. It was very efficient on short vectors, much more efficient than some of the other machines. And it was competitive for very long vectors. So think of, the, and, and that's the mission, right? So the mission is, is of a machine like Power 10 is no, be good at scalar, be good at vector, and be good at matrix, because now it's a new thing. And matrix units will complement scalar and vector units. They have to provide some differentiation, some to make for the loss of generality. Like you can do everything in scalar. You can do some things in vector. You can do fewer things in, in, um, uh, in matrix. So in Power 10, we did, no, partly on purpose and partly because it's what we could do, a 2x differentiation. So we have a certain amount of scalar processing capability. We can produce 256 bits of result per cycle. Our vector capability is two times that. Our matrix capability is two times that. Intel on Sapphire Rapids went into a more differentiated, right? So their vector is actually eight times faster than their scalar, and their matrix is eight times uh, 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 more more. They can produce eight times more result in the matrix unit than the vector unit. So they're more differentiated. And I think, no, we have to find a balance. I, I, don't, I, I, know, I don't know that we are right. I don't know that, that they are the best. I, I, I have a suspicion that a proper differentiation would be a 4x. I mean, that's what I would like to see in the future is, is, a, is a processor where the vector is four times faster than the scalar and the matrix is four times faster than the vector. That's what I would like to see. It's my intuition. I don't have no, uh, a strong argument for that yet, but it feels about right. So I'll continue investigating and pursuing that. And you know, the importance of the small matrices, um, you, know, um, you, you do have to support small matrices because if you cast every small problem to a big problem, you will suffer. So you take, so for example, a nine by nine matrix multiply, which is a common operation in NetBone. NetBone is an important DOE benchmark for the Coral programs. And they have no, or they can be configured with a lot of nine by nine matrix multiplies. And it takes 729 uh, uh, multiply adds to compute a nine by nine matrix multiply. If I were to cast that nine by nine into a 16 by 16, because let's say my matrix unit was a natural 16 by 16 a unit, I would get 496 operations. So fill up with zeros, fill up the nine by nine with zeros to make it 16 by 16. It will take me 4,096 operations to do the result that I could have done with 729. So even if I gain a lot of performance, I lose a lot of efficiency and may not be useful. So that's why I know 
we have to have a way. And, 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 and by the way, uh, Sapphire Rapids does have a way. Now, even though I say the, the, uh, the, 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 the register file is naturally 16 by 16 or, or the tiles are 16 by 16, they have a way to do like you no know, smaller matrices. Um, so, um, uh, so after 50 years of pursuing performance through vector processing, we are ready to move to the next level matrix processing through dedicated units. Matrix processing will not re re replace vector processing. The CPUs will have to deliver performance on all three, scalar, vector, and matrix. In the specific case of Power 10, the MMA instructions, our matrix instructions provided a new level of performance. And we demonstrated this on both dense and sparse matrix computations. We demonstrated on AI benchmarks. Now, GPUs are already on the fourth generation, has worked very well for them. That's how GPUs deliver their petaflops of performance at advertising. And you no know, Power 10, I say it was the first commercial CPU with a matrix unit and will not be the, the last. You'll see announced machines from Z16 and, Sapphire, and Intel, from IBM Z and, and Intel with Sapphire Rapids. And maybe we'll see operations beyond the arithmetic semi ring, right? All the work I, I showed here and, and the instructions we have on Power 10 are for arithmetic, it's multiply add. But no, you could have a different ring. You could have a plus, uh, 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 what a min-max semi-ring, and you can do still do matrix operations with on different semi-rings. And the other development that I ask people to take a look look at the ARM scalable matrix extension. You may be familiar with the scalable vector extension, which has been implemented several times. But they have announced and published for version nine of the architecture a scalable matrix extension. So I'm not aware of any implementations yet, but they could be coming. I want to see what they do with that. Looks very exciting. Finally, make your fall plans. Pact 2022, it's coming up in October. Lawrence can tell you more. Uh, I'm the program chair. Uh, Lawrence is the steering committee chair. We're putting together a very uh, uh, exciting program. Hope to see you all in Chicago in October. And with that, and uh, I'll leave you some a list of papers or uh, publications that you may wanna look more. And uh, that's, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I went over time, sorry. Virginia did not go over time. So we have another, you know, maybe 10 minutes to talk. If you guys have questions, I see uh, Jen has some a question. You so actually, you can, you can go ahead and ask him. I'll just try not to, to serialize the, the questions. So actually, Jen, go ahead. Uh, actually, my question was typed just when Joe says, move to that part of the talk. Uh, so I get very good comparison. But the one, uh, still one of the minor question, I think, Jose, is uh, what's the rationale for a power 10 matrix unit to support 4-bit and 16-bit integers, which is, are not supported by NVIDIA or Intel? So, so very good question. So uh, NVIDIA actually supports 4-bit, but not in their matrix unit, right? They have, uh, they, uh, which, they, they, and they supported for a while. Uh, they had, a, they had a, a GPU that was explicitly optimized for 4-bit and did very well. So we, um, we, we, we had good feedback that 4-bit was useful. Um, remember, at, at some point also, uh, let, me, let me be honest uh, here. Um, Where's my, uh, sorry, Chen, I'll be quick. Oh uh, yeah. Once you design an ALU that can do 164 bit floating point, 232 bit floating point, 416 bit floating point, 416 bit integer, 18, eight, eight bit integer, doing a four bit integer is not much more, right? You, you can see that. It's kind of a, no, maybe another percent of area, maybe, I, I don't know uh, the exact numbers, but it, 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 it was not that difficult to put the four bit. And we had a, a feedback from people doing machine learning that it was a, a, um, a, a data format coming and our customers had used in Power9, which could be coupled with that um, NVIDIA GPU that had four bit support. So there was, there was a, a requirement there. The 16-bit integer is a good question. It feels a little bit more of a completeness, right? We had we had vector instructions that did 16-bit. Um, so we said, okay, so we can do a 16-bit integer in vector. Now it seems to be a good thing to complete this and do the matrix instruction 16-bit. It's true that the the um, deep learning community seems to be favoring primarily the B float 16. 
and the int eight, but we thought no well advised to keep the 16 bit. Again, it was no, we already were doing so much there that having the 16 bit support was, was, uh, was no, not a big burden. It, it, com it complemented the vector instructions well. And no, um, I'm, I'm not discarding that they, 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 they could be useful in deep learning in the future or, or maybe useful on, on things that we're not doing yet. Like when you say, when you look at graph processing with different semi rings, the integer, uh, maybe, maybe it's useful there. Address computation, right? You have sparse matrices where the offsets are 16 bit integers and I can do an address computation with my matrix unit. Uh, maybe we can do that. So I now has not been the focus of deep learning. I agree with you. It's certainly not the focus of linear algebra, right? Linear algebra blast has been primarily a floating point. We, we actually, we were the first ones to add the BFLOAT 16 in, in, in the open blast. So now Intel also has that, but open blast has BFLOAT 16 support and, and looks like open blast and blast will continue to be primarily floating point. Other libraries do the int eight and the BFLOAT 16, um, but though we are, we are, we are doing the six, we're doing the 16 and the four bit because we got some feedback they could be useful. Does that, does that help? Now the question about GPUs and, and, and CPUs with at least two of you asked, right? Okay, so remember, uh, scalar didn't kill, no, sorry, vector didn't kill scalar, matrix is not gonna kill vectors, GPUs didn't kill CPUs, CPUs are not killing uh, uh, GPUs or TPUs, right? This is not, we, computing is a hundred years old, right? We can't kill things. This is not the time for natural, so, well, uh, I guess all this time for natural selection, but this is not the time to shoot your horse. We don't know which horse is better, right? We are a, a young uh, science. Uh, no, look at physics. It took 300 years to go from first mathematical formulations to quantum mechanics and general relativity, which are you no know, kind of good, <laughs> clearly incomplete. Don't think for a moment that computer science is done. Right, we 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 don't even know if p equals n p, right? So no, we we don't know if CPUs are. I don't think there's such a thing as one being better than the other. You use the tool that you need. No, hammers didn't uh, replace uh, uh, pliers, and pliers don't replace hammers. You you need everything, and that's good. That's called employment. So, yeah, and more than that is called creativity. We can create more that way. It's a very optimistic view of the future, Jose. Oh. So there are a couple of uh, questions that are still there. Yes. Uh, so Ling Chi Zhang was asking about CPUs. Do you want to put the question yourself or? Well, the, the, the CPU, like I said, no, I, I don't think um, CPUs are efficient enough. I mean, I think, I think the Power 10 is, MMA is efficient enough for what it is, but no, GPUs have more raw performance. No, GPUs have 800 square millimeters of silicon, much more than 10 square millimeters is, matrix, is, is computation. So no, GPUs have more raw performance, but they have less of other things, right? I, 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 I haven't tried to run a Python code in a GPU <laughs> and, and I think if you run a Python code that call a library to do a, um, a financial modeling right then and there, you may take more time transferring the problem to the GPU than doing on the CPU. And then the problem may not fit in the GPU. Financial models can be incredibly big. So right tool for the job, right? I think there are tools that need a GPU and should use the GPU and tools that need a CPU and should use a CPU. My goal and the goal of people doing matrix units for CPUs is make the code that works on CPU works better, work better. That's all. Right. So we have to buy uh, one of each. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you should buy two of each. Okay. I'll sell you. Don't worry. I'm sure I'd be able to sell and, you and, anything. And we always do a discount. You know, it's two for twice the price. No more than that. <laughs> it's linear. No, okay. no, it's no more than linear. I guarantee you. Kirk, any question? Yeah, I think it's self-explanatory. Uh, uh, excellent talk, by the way. Thank, um, thank you, Kirk. The impact on memory design. Uh, minimal changes, dramatic changes, exotic changes. What are your thoughts there? Very good, very good question. So um, we had, OK, in pow Power has usually been designed with a lot of memory bandwidth. And Power 10 was designed with even more memory bandwidth than Power 9. And, and, and it can grow as is, it doesn't, and we actually designed Power 10 so the memory could grow 
um, the memory bandwidth uh, could grow on the field when I mean, uh, 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 there may be some validation issues, but the same memory interface that we have, we can double the, 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 the memory bandwidth. So um, Power 10 was designed with a lot of memory bandwidth, so has not, no, I think we have appropriate. Um, I think the, um, if I were to say, um, um, uh, you, and obviously GPUs are designed with an enormous amount of memory bandwidth, right? So, but but again, matrix processing, conv, you know, convolution, dense linear algebra, convolution, these are all n times something complexity, right? They they do more than one operation per element, so they they can be memory friendly. Um, sparse is more of a challenge. SPMV is a big of a challenge. I mean, SPMM, we, we got, you know, you're going to see um, Sharif got several cases with either a teraflop, double precision, or, or, or two teraflops, double precision, a single precision, sorry. Um, matrix vector is, is more of an issue, right? The matrix vector, you, you, you kind of limited by the memory bandwidth. And you don't necessarily get much from the matrix unit. If you, if you get if you get some, it's usually some complex matrix, uh, complex arithmetic. Um, but what you do, I mean, I think matrix units, and this I didn't, I, I didn't make a bullet, but I should have because it's important. Matrix units can be enough of a, um, a revolution to encourage people to change their code, and we we, we are working with some customers on that and say, oh, where I did a matrix vector, now let me do multiple matrix vector because I can do them essentially for free, right? So the cost of doing a matrix matrix is more or less the same as a matrix vector. So now I can do multiple right-hand sides at the same time. And uh, with that, I overcome some of the limitations of uh, of the memory bandwidth that matrix vector inherently will have. Um, I think uh, no, one, one thing that I do think is important if you are going to build a attached processor and, and if, if your matrix unit is gonna be big, I think this thing that I showed here where the matrix feeds directly from L2, L3 is, is kind of important. Um, much of my code, no, Power10 is not like that, right? We do feed, Power10 is, uh, is the fully integrated. So uh, our matrix unit does feed from the same register file and therefore from the same L1. Um, but much of the code I wrote kind of bypasses the L1, right? It's kind of, no, if the L1 wasn't there, I wouldn't even know because I'm, I'm essentially streaming from the L2 and our L2 and L1 have the same, uh, the same bandwidth, the 64 bytes per cycle. So I, I would say that, that you, need, you need a strong L2. If you're gonna have a matrix unit, you need a strong L2. That's very high bandwidth L2. And then, you know, the more memory bandwidth all is better. But if, you're, if your computation is memory bandwidth limited, think about changing the computation. Now, even if it means let's do, don't do the same work faster, do more work because it's free. So now I can do more work in the same time that I did less work. So the benefit of that more work now is, 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 is 100%, right? It's, it's a zero cost. So twice the results for the same price. It's better than the deal I offered Lawrence. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there was another question from um, was it was Chen? Was it, uh, Chen? I think, uh, oh, uh, Wesley uh, Smith. But yeah, Wesley. Let me ask uh, Wesley. Wesley, does all matrix processing hardware use the outer product? Um, uh, yes, to, to the best of my knowledge, the, the outer product is is kind of a, a two dimensional array, and it's what you want, right? It's a two dimensional structure. I mean. Um, you, you can sli make slightly changes, right? The outer, pro outer product, outer product means two vectors, you know, column vector, uh, uh, row vector, and, and all to all. You could have variations where you kind of shift to one of the vectors or circulate them, and, but they, they still, they're still outer products, just that you're moving the data as you're making them. So essentially how, that's how you get convolution directly done in some is by you know, shifting the data. But the, the overall, if you look at the structure, it's you know, what's happening at, the, at any given moment is an outer product. Um, um, let's see, um, thank, thanks for everybody who liked the presentation. Chan, to follow. Oh, is the granularity eight by eight limited by memory bandwidth? Yeah, certainly the, 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 the larger the granularity, the less bandwidth you need because it's N square over N, right? right? So um, you, you get a gain of N. Was that the question, Chan, or did I misunderstand? Um, I thought you 
could uh, do eight by eight if you really do it in the same time as uh, four by four. So that means twice the bandwidth demand. And then, but but uh, yeah, but uh, four times more work, right? So you, yeah. you 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 you're 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 you improved. I mean, yeah. So I mean, you you your efficiency is n because it's n square operation of n elements. So if n is four, n square is sixteen. So sixteen over four. If n is eight, this is sixty four. So now you got eight operations per element. So the larger the n, the larger the efficiency. But yes. you know, as I, as, I, as I showed another one, you have to be careful because if it's too big and you have to pad with zeros, your efficiency goes down. So. Right, right. But assuming in perfect case, all of these are real computations. I, I can see your uh, peak flops, power 11, 12, gross, uh, quadratic. But then still, the bandwidth need to increase linearly. At some point, it is meant to will just stop you uh, because the bandwidth is limiting. Oh. Uh, Yes, yes. I mean, I think I think it will, and that's why you know GPUs put a lot of effort in having a lot of uh, memory bandwidth as well, right? I think Hopper will have three ter three terabytes per second of bandwidth, and um, um, like I said, power ten to power nine, we double the bandwidth. We can double again. You no know, power ten itself can double the, the its memory bandwidth. We have the channels to double. Um, uh, power eleven will have more bandwidth than power ten, so we'll continue to grow the bandwidth probably. No, uh, well, we didn't double power eight. Power eight, power nine was more or less the same bandwidth, but we double power power uh, nine to ten. We'll you know probably double power ten to eleven. So we want we want to keep growing the bandwidth. Um, um, but but the other thing, it's not just bandwidth, right? The very important property of a CPU is the memory size, the capacity of the memory. You need to be able to contain the problem that your user your customer wants and for financial modeling can be very large some of some new machine learning models can be very large so we need to have that capacity both of them have to grow and i think it's this combination of you no know, decent memory bandwidth you no know, power 10 will will with the a refresh of the memory get close to a terabyte right now it's it's 400 gigabytes per second but we said we can double again power 11 will hopefully be better than that um, so it's 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 no let's say half a terabyte per second of bandwidth, 64 terabytes of capacity, 64 terabytes. So that combination of bandwidth and capacity is the distinguishing factor of a powerful enterprise level CPU. It has to have enough processing, but it has to have enough and with enough processing requires enough bandwidth, but has to have enough capacity. And the capacity is multi terabytes. Um, so I. Think no, I Clear answer from you now, just to confirm is that what Dimitri also started asking about granularity right now is not constrained by bandwidth. It's really what you said about utilization. Yeah, I think I, I, think, I, think, I, think, I, think. I, I think that uh, it's nine, well, eight, ten twenty-three already. And for, we have to meet again at 10:30. So I think that we should thank Jose for an absolutely great talk. Chen will ask his questions directly to Jose later. I won't be there. And uh, you're welcome to join. Right. <laughs> yeah, OK. Uh, so I, uh, I think that we should all thank Jose for a great talk, for educational uh, talk and for his optimism yes. for the future of computing. <laughs> Always, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I'm honored and delighted. I mean, this I couldn't be happier. Thank you so much. I can, see, we can see that you're there. <laughs> I couldn't be happier. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you all. And at uh, half of the hour, we restart. So yeah, we'll do start whatever you have to do. Do, yeah. we, do. do we log out or just hang uh, out? You what don't do have we... to log out. You can stay on the same. You can also use okay. the private chat. If you want a breakout room, let us know. And we'll okay. do that. If you people know. want to send okay. me private chats, keep keep sending. I'm, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome to continue the discussion. And we all stay in the same room. We'll start again the next session in five minutes. Okay.